All right. Yeah, so uh, my name's Mark, and um, this is my wife here, and <laughs> my son Lucas, and I've got another one somewhere, Boaz. Lucas turning two today. Um, so that's our little family. Uh, I was actually born here in Tauranga, and uh, I got saved when I was 15 years old at Primal Youth, which is uh, part of C3 Church. Um, I attended there till just a few years ago when um, me and my wife decided to move overseas to live in her country for a bit. And uh, when we came back, we thought it was a good time to change church and um, came down to Life Zone here and really liked it. And um, so we've been coming here since the start of the year and enjoying being part of the Life Zone family. So yeah, that's a bit about us. So today I'm going to uh, carry on where Charlie left off from last week, talking about Galatians uh, 4, 21 through to 31. But um, before I get into that bit of the scripture, I kind of want to set the context so we know what Paul is talking about. I'll just get my notes that uh, I've left down here. And um, yeah, so... I'm going to turn back to Genesis 21, uh, 12, 2, and we're going to look at a little timeline that's going to be popping up on the uh, projector there. So this is the story of a couple who's playing a very, very important role in history, but potentially from their perspective, they're just a couple trying to start a family. They, they just want to have children, as a lot of people do experience. It can be an extremely scary thing when you are trying to have kids and it's not happening. And so for this couple, it's Abraham and Sarah, and there is a promise that God makes Abraham when he's 65 years old. He says to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. And that's quite old, actually, to be trying to have kids already. Like, I'd be a bit nervous. They've probably been trying for years already. Again, though, Abra uh, God makes another promise in Genesis 14. And I'm guessing this is a few years down the track. And he tells Abraham that look north, look south, look east, look west. All of this I am giving to you and your offspring. And your offspring will be like the dust of the earth. So if anyone can count them so that they could count your offspring. Now again, um, God makes another promise to Abraham in 15, uh, chapter 15 of Genesis. And this time, God has just greatly blessed Abraham again. But Abraham uh, turns and says to God, what is the point of all of this that you've given me? He's really wealthy at this stage. They literally have everything that a family could want at that stage, bar children. And he says to God, what is the point of this? I have no heir. My servant is going to inherit all of this. And Ab uh, God tells Abraham to go outside and look up at the stars and count them and says, this is the number of your descendants. Now, I get the picture that God's trying to get Abraham to see that there's something a little bit bigger going on here than just him having a child. I'm not sure if he's getting it or not, but <laughs> there's a whole lot of actually really cool uh, things going on here in the Bible, but I'm not going to go into all of them because I just want to focus on this part of the story. Now, a bit further down the track in Genesis 16.1, Abraham is now 86 years old. And we can read here in 16. Now, Sari, Abraham's wife, had bore him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sari said to Abraham, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant, it may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sari. And after Abraham had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, 
Sari, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abraham, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she, res- um, she conceived... And when she saw that she conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sari said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you. I gave you my servant uh, to your embrace. And when she saw that she conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sari, behold, your servant is in your power. Do to you her as you please. And Sari dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. Now what happens next is Hagar runs away out into the desert, and the angel of the Lord comes to her and tells her to go back and submit to Sari and uh, live in Abraham's household. And she also tells her to name her son Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. So what's happened here is God has made a promise to Abraham the whole way along. And at this stage, Abraham and Sar, or Abraham, as he's called at that time, take things into their take matters into their own hands to create a child to try and start a family. And this causes all sorts of strife, chaos, and trouble in the Abraham um, household. You can imagine things are a little bit awkward now. Time goes on, and uh, in Genesis 15, God comes to Abraham again and makes him another promise. He's now 99 years old and tells him that he will have a son by his wife, um, Sarah. In Genesis 18, or sorry, back in 17, he also makes a new covenant with Abraham. And with that, he changes Abraham's name from Abraham to Abraham and says, Sarah, Sarah, uh, sorry, will now be Sarah. Um, and so on. And then in Genesis 18, again, God comes and makes a promise again and says, next year I'm going to come at the appointed time and Sarah, you will have had a child by then. Mm -hmm. Finally, when Abraham is 100 years old and Sarah is 90 years old, the promise is fulfilled. Sarah becomes pregnant and gives birth to a child. Anyone. I'll just read through that one because there's some important details here. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called him, called the name of his son who was born to him whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son, Isaac, when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son, Isaac, was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, yet I have bore him a son in my old age. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw that the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she bore to Abraham, was laughing. So Ishmael was laughing at Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out the slave woman with her son, for the, son, for the son of the slave woman shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account this was still his son. But God said to Abraham, 
Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And so what happens is Abraham basically gives Hagar a little bit of food and provisions and sends them out into the desert. And God does take care of them from there. So what's happened here is essentially setting the same theme that Paul uh, is having throughout the whole Galatians, which is doing things out of human effort creates a place of slavery for us. But believing in God's promises and having redemption through Jesus Christ and living in faith gives us a life of freedom. So these are the basic two things. Human effort, trying to make it happen, creates slavery. Trusting in God, living by faith is freedom. All right, let's look at Galatians 21 through to 31 now. box. Someone told me that if you take your Bible out the box, it'll start falling apart. And it's actually really true. <laughs> That's why I'm trying to keep the box going. All right. So uh, as Charlie said last week, the context of the situation is that the Galatian Christians have got some Jewish people or believers of the Jewish law in their church, and they are trying to get the Galatian Christians who have accepted Jesus Christ, they're basically telling them that they also need to follow the Jewish law. And uh, Paul is arguing against it. He said, you either have one or the other. You either have live, follow the law and live in slavery, or you have freedom. You can't do both. So, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do not listen to the law, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and one by the free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, out of human effort, while the son of the free woman was born through promise by a miracle that Sarah got pregnant by the power of God. Now this may be interpreted, I can't even say this word in my Bible. I wonder what it says up there. <laughs> All allegorically. <laughs> These uh, women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children from slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai and Ab in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. And what Paul's talking about here is the Jewish people in Jerusalem, they haven't fully accepted, or they haven't accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So they are trying to still be right with God through the Jewish law by following the, co the commandments and the rituals and the days and everything in there and by their efforts trying to be righteous. And he says it's like the present day Jerusalem is what they are. But Jerusalem above is free. So he's talking now about a heavenly Jerusalem. And she is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren one, who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of the promise. 
Because when God took Abraham outside and said, look up at the stars, he was not just talking about his line of children, his great-great-great-great-grandchildren and children, but he was also talking about, in your family, we're going to be doing a lot of adoption through Jesus Christ. Okay, so some of those stars represented us sitting here today <laughs> when he was looking up there. And that was, that was the bigger picture that God, he was, I don't know if Abraham stood a chance of trying to understand it at the time, but he was definitely showing it. All right, where do we get up to? <laughs> okay, but just as at the time he was born according to the flesh, so Ishmael, who was born from the slave woman, was persecuting him who was born of the spirit. So this is when he was laughing at the weaning party, that, that he was laughing at Isaac. It also is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the free woman. So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free. So, we've already well established that the Jews in Jerusalem, they are living in slavery, and they are trying to get the Christians also to get under this law and live in slavery. And that the, the, we have freedom for, through Jesus Christ by being saved. We no longer have to, by our works and our effort, do anything to be children of God. By Jesus Christ, we're already accepted. Now, because we live a long way away from Jerusalem in this side of the world, and I don't think there's very many people here in New Zealand trying to follow um, Judaism and, and the Jewish um, law, that these people were in that time, does that mean that we're not affected by this? I think absolutely not. And we're going to do a little activity now. So I'm going to ask everybody to stand up and go sit in a new seat. All right? And as you do this activity or this little exercise, your mind's probably racing a little bit. You're wondering, how far do I have to go? Should I take my bag with me? Do I need to take my pen and pencil? Am I going to be coming back to my old seat? Am I allowed to go with my friends? Or do you need to go alone? And the reason you're thinking all that is I didn't give you any specific instructions. And just like that little exercise, so is life. One day we just start living. We've got a blank slate. We just, we're just here in the world. And we need a way to live. So our parents and our caregivers and the people in our life raise us up. They teach us values, principles, things to live by so that we can function here on earth and operate in society. And along with all these things that they teach us, in the absence of the Jewish law that they had, and in the absence of walking in a relationship with Jesus Christ, we need a measure of success in life. We need to know how well we're doing. I, you know, for, for me, I, I remember like there was always the thing of, oh, when you're 30 years old, you know, have you ticked off the boxes? Have you got the car? Have you brought a house? Do you have children? What are you doing well, <laughs> well in life? Do you have the job that you want to? All of these things, try to, we, we try to measure how well we are doing. And uh, Steve lent me a book by this guy, Tim, Clary, uh, Tim Kelly, uh, called Galatians for You. And he has an awesome little illustration there of four personalities. And I've got four volunteers here that are going to uh, help me illustrate this to you. So I've got a couple of people I want to introduce you to. These are made-up personalities. These people aren't actually going to them. All right, so 
first one is the person who has the attitude of, I am the best. The next person is, I am not the best. This person is, I define the best. And the last person is the one we really all want to be. God is the best. <laughs> all right, I want to talk a little bit about uh, these people here. So this person, I am the best. This person is, uh, do we got the slide for up there? Cheers. Um, this person, they are in the top left corner by the Jewish law uh, viewpoint. So this person relies on the law for their righteousness in God, and they live by the law. So this is like the Pharisees at the time of the Bible. This person has these really high standards of which to live by, and they, by their own uh, understanding, live up to them. And they know that they are the best because they have measured themselves, and by their sight, they are right in God. In our modern day world, this is maybe someone who sets really high standards for themselves. They believe that if they get this high profile job, if they have friends with status, or even any of us, we set expectations and we believe if we obtain those, we are doing well. And this is our measure of success in life. And this, this person here, when they did the little activity earlier, they thought to themselves, if I, the, the stand up and move seats exercise, if I move the furthest, that will be the best for this activity. <laughs> and so this person hopped up and they spotted the furthest seat from theirs and they moved as far as they could all the way across the room. And when they sat down, they felt good because they knew they had achieved this high standard they had set. And they looked at the others of you out there that didn't move as far. <laughs> And they say, well, clearly I am better than them because I moved further. So the problem with this person is they're always looking down on others and they are critical of others. Now this next person here is like this person here. They rely on the law. They believe living up to high standards gives you righteousness, gives you success in life. But this person doesn't achieve it. And they feel they are a failure. They feel they lack confidence because they believe that you, you, you must put in the hard work to achieve this, but they're unable to. And this person, when they did their little activity, they too thought you must go to the other side of the room. And they started out, but then they saw a seat right there and they thought, well, that one's much easier. I'll sit down here. <laughs> But then when they sat down, they thought, well, I did set myself, you know, the expectation of going over there. I, I, did, I don't feel so good about myself now. The next person here, now this person is actually quite clever. What they've decided to do is they've done away with relying on the law. They are, this box down here, they neither rely on the law nor do they live by the law. They actually just kind of make their own as they go along. So what this person did when they did the activity, they hopped up and they started moving. Then they saw a seat right next to them and thought, oh, I'll just take this one right here. And then they sat down and they said to themselves, actually, that's a really good standard. You know? That's, that's really good. And as this person goes through life, they justify everything they do. I did, actually, I did really well there. That was, that was good. The last person is the person we all want to be. This one is the one who does not rely on the law. They do not set standards for themselves. They do not live by any law or religion to measure themselves up to. But they live with God. They know that by Jesus Christ dying on the cross, 
their sins have redeemed them. They've accepted Jesus Christ, and they know that they are a child of God. And there's nothing they can do to improve that. They are perfect by what Jesus has done. But the amazing thing about it is the outworkings of this person's life, the fruit of them uh, walking with God, is that they actually live up to an amazing standard. These people have lots of success in things in life. And why is that? It's not because they are trying hard to achieve it. It's not because it even matters to them. It's because when you do life with God, he obviously does not set us up to fail, but sets us up to succeed and do well. All right. Thank you very much, girls. So the awesome thing about what Jesus has done and the salvation that we find through God is we die to our old selves, just like it shows in baptism, and we lay down all these preconceived standards and expectations we have set for ourselves. And just like the symbolism of being baptized, we go down under the water, and when we come up, we are a new creation. And God starts to work and build on us and create us into the person that he always planned us to be. But as we go through life walking with God, these other little personalities, they tend to sneak into our lives. Unfortunately, it's the reality. (laughs) But it's why I've come... I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to share this with us today. I, um, one of the things about when uh, I was going to my old church, I started when I was 15 years old and I was really involved. I did everything. I'd, I'd turn up and put all the chairs out and help the band set up. And I, you know, I started... I literally served in possibly every team there was available to serve in at some different point. And towards the end of it, I was on the emceeing roster and the preaching roster. And when we made this decision to move overseas, one of my fears was that I wouldn't get to preach again because I'd have to go to some church and serve there for 10 years (laughs) before someone gave me the opportunity. (laughs) And so what I'd done there is I'd set an expectation and I had enslaved myself that I now have to go and do 10 years of hard work before I, <laughs> before I might get to an opportunity to do something that I really love to do. And it was amazing because it was like God said it to me at the time, if I have called you to preach, you will preach. You're going to do it. And uh, it was amazing because even when we moved overseas and I lived in my wife's country, they don't speak, they do speak English there, but they speak another language. Even there, I got opportunities to share and and, um, share the word of God and do it through a translator sometimes. And it was amazing. And so actually even standing here today is like a fulfillment of that promise of God. And when we trust in him and don't let ourselves build up expectations and rules that we have to live by, we can see the promises and the miracles of God fulfilled in us. Talking about these little personalities sneaking in, even while I was preparing this sermon today, I was practicing uh, running through it, And I was going through the bit of Abraham's timeline. And I kept getting mixed up saying Abraham and Abram and saying it at the wrong time and and getting Sarah's name mixed up. And I said to myself, if you're going to do a good job of this sermon, you really need to get that right. You better practice this bit over and over again until you get it right. I felt like God right then just said to me, and the point of the sermon is... (laughs) 
by trying to fulfill expectations of myself, I'm not going to make anything any better. And there becomes a certain point where we can only be prepared so much in life, and we can only do so much in life, and the rest we have to leave for God, because that is the miracle. Um, I'll just invite the band to come up now. So, um, if you're here today and uh, you've got maybe expectations, maybe things that someone else has put on you, I know we're all, when we're all growing up, we feel things like we need to achieve something. Maybe we need to go to uni and we need to get in a, a, a good degree and we need to do well at this and well at that. And I think, you know, having expectations and having goals for us to obtain, I'm not saying that they're bad, but when they are things that enslave us to a life we're not meant to live and take us in a direction we're not meant to go, they take us away from walking with God. And the other thing we're going to do is at the end of the service, just like the exercise we did of standing up, we're actually going to do that again, but we're going to be getting up from here and we're going to be going out into the world. And when we go out, when we walk our life with God, we don't need to know exactly what we have to achieve. I could get up here and preach today and no one would like it. And you could all boo me. But if I did what God wanted me to do and said what he wanted me to say, it doesn't matter if anyone comes up to me and says good job or if anyone boos me. The point is I did the will of God and did what he wanted. And that's like everything in our life, running our businesses, going to work and serving our employers. The point is we do it with God for God and that is the measure it's I'm doing it for God I'm I, I can't succeed any more than being a child that's the ultimate thing cool well I'm just going to close now and I just want to pray quickly that if there's anybody here who has expectations on their life as Paul says in the end of uh, chapter 4 he says cast out the slave woman and her child and we need to cast out the expectations in our lives that enslave us and stop us from living the true call that God has planned for us so Lord I just pray that in all of us you would help us to cast out those things that do not let us be fully in you and let us accept our identity as children in you, God. And I pray, Lord, we all live a life not of trying to make things happen out of our own will, but we can serve you with all our effort and all our heart, God. And we can see miracles and promises come true through you, God. Thank you so much, God, for freeing us, for giving a life of freedom, for accepting us as your children and adopting us into your family and giving us a life far better than what we could ever create for ourselves. <laughs>